Imagine a factory full of machines working together. Who's keeping everything in check? That's right, PLCs. They control all sorts of industrial processes, but PLCs don't just wake up knowing what to do. Automation engineers program them and load the instructions into the CPU, and that's when the real action begins. There are five PLC programming languages defined by the IEC 61131-3 standard. We already covered ladder diagram and function block diagram in our previous video. If you missed that, the link's in the description. In this video, sequential function charts, structured text, and instruction list will be discussed. Sequential function charts, or SFC, is a graphical language. It comes from an older logic model called Graphsit, developed in France for sequential control. If you've ever used flowcharts for problem solving, SFC is going to feel pretty intuitive. It's similar in structure and function, though with some key differences. In SFC, the whole process is built around steps, transitions, and how they connect. Steps are like checkpoints in a sequence, each representing a distinct operation in the process. These steps contain actions, which execute specific tasks while that step is active. Actions are made up of two sections. The first is the action qualifier, which controls when and how the action should be executed. It is done using short letter codes that define the execution behavior. The second section is the action code, where the actual logic is written to control actuators, turning electrical signals into mechanical movements. On most platforms, actions are written in structured text. Then, there are transitions which act as decision points. When a transition condition is met, the next step is activated and the previous step is turned off. You can use any PLC compliant language to program transitions, but ladder diagram and function block diagram are more common here. SFC programs always start at the initial step, right at the top of the chart. When the program is running, it stays in that step and continuously scans the logic until the transition condition becomes true. The moment that happens, it moves on to the next step and then the next, following the sequence until it reaches the final step. What happens after that depends on the program setup. If you've set up a cyclic transition, the process loops right back to the beginning and runs continuously. If it's a one-time operation, it just stops at the last step. But in some cases, the program might wait for an external command to reset and start over. SFC has some great advantages. First, it makes complex processes way more manageable by breaking them down into smaller, easier to understand steps. Another big win is how easy it is to monitor during runtime because you can visually see which step is active at any given moment. Also, SFC is a game changer for debugging because you can directly see where a fault happens so you can pinpoint and fix the issue. On top of that, PLC development can be faster because SFC lets you reuse individual pieces of logic, reducing redundant work. And if you're dealing with parallel operations that need to sync up at some point, SFC handles that as well. As great as SFC is, it's not without its downsides. First, it's not exactly the most universal language out there. You won't find it useful in every scenario, so its applications are somewhat limited. The SFC program doesn't easily translate into other PLC languages in a standardized way. Some vendor-specific tools help with conversion, but you often end up sacrificing readability and efficiency along the way. Another challenge is that while SFC is great at handling multiple process flows, things can get complicated when those flows start branching off in different directions. Let's see where the SFC language comes in handy. If a process follows a strict sequence, one step must finish before the next begins. SFC is a great choice. It's also great for batch processes. With SFC, you can organize different production phases while syncing up multiple tasks running in parallel. Next up, we've got Structured Text or ST. If you've ever worked with programming languages like Pascal or C, then this one will feel pretty familiar. ST is a high-level, text-based PLC programming language, and its syntax looks a lot like what you'd see in traditional coding. Let's talk about how ST code is structured. It's all about statements. Each one ends with a semicolon. These ST statements can be simple or compound, and they use operands to handle operations such as arithmetic, 
logical decisions, or variable assignments. Speaking of variables, they're everywhere. Some are linked to physical inputs and outputs, while others just store data internally. Functions are another key part of ST. They take inputs, do some calculations, and give results. Also, don't skip comments. They help you document your code right inside the program, which is a lifesaver when troubleshooting later. Here's how an ST program runs inside a PLC. It's all about cycles that repeat nonstop. First, the PLC reads the input signals and updates the input variables. Then, it processes the ST code from top to bottom, temporarily storing output values in memory. At the end of the cycle, it writes those values to physical outputs, ensuring your system responds as needed. This loop keeps going indefinitely, keeping everything synchronized and predictable, essential for automation. Let's break down why structured text is such a powerful tool. First, it supports high-level programming constructs that would be inefficient to implement in other PLC languages. Structured text is highly portable. Why? Because, unlike other PLC languages, ST code is easy to transfer to other IEC-compliant PLCs with minimal adjustments. Also, since ST is purely text-based, you can write your logic in a regular text file, copy and paste it into your PLC project, and you're good to go. Another big win is that the ST is structured and easy to read, making debugging and organizing your logic way easier. Plus, if you ever need help, even a software programmer can probably jump in and assist since ST has syntax similar to traditional coding. Let's discuss the downsides of structured text. First, not all PLC brands fully support the ST. Some legacy PLCs don't play nice with text-based programming and stick to graphical options. Unlike the ladder diagram, where active circuit parts visually light up, ST is just plain text. No color cues, no instant visual feedback. You need to manually check which conditions are true or false. Lastly, ST does require some basic programming knowledge. If you've never coded before, it might feel overwhelming at first. Let's explore which types of applications use structured text. If your project involves complex calculations or advanced algorithms, ST handles it with ease. It's also great for data-heavy applications where you need to filter, search, or manage large amounts of information. And let's not forget loops. Since ST supports loop structures, it's an ideal choice for dealing with repetitive tasks. No need for clunky workarounds. The Instruction List, or IL, is a low-level, textual-based language resembling assembly. While it provides direct control over PLC, it remains more readable than raw machine code. If you've ever worked with CNC machines or robotics and are familiar with G-Code, IL might seem a little familiar since they both focus on direct, step-by-step -step hardware control. In an IL program, everything boils down to four key components. Instructions, operators, operands, and modifiers. Each line of an instruction list represents exactly one instruction. Then there are operators, which are the actual commands that tell the PLC what to do, always written in standardized mnemonics. Operands come next. They're the elements that operators act on, whether that's memory addresses, registers, or constants. Lastly, we have modifiers to tweak the default behavior of operators, allowing for logical inversions, edge-sensitive execution, or even status-dependent operations. By default, the program runs step-by-step, step, from top to bottom and left to right. But that's not the only way it works. The jump command allows it to hop around, skipping sections and moving to specific parts as needed. Let's dive into the advantages of IL. First, it's incredibly compact. If you need a short and efficient program, IL is a great choice. It's also super fast, perfect for applications where split-second reactions are critical. And since it uses minimal memory, you can keep your program lightweight without sacrificing performance. Let's talk about the not-so-great side of IL. First, debugging is tricky. When errors pop up, you're left staring at lines of code, trying to pinpoint the issue. Another drawback is that IL isn't the most beginner-friendly language. But if you're a pro, you might like its streamlined style. Lastly, IL is slowly fading from the industry. 
It still exists in legacy systems and isn't recommended in modern PLC programming. IL still finds its place in specific applications. It's a solid choice for older PLCs with limited memory, making it useful in legacy automation systems. Plus, its fast execution speed makes it ideal for high-speed processes where precision timing is critical. Also, when it comes to retrofits, IL helps keep aging equipment running smoothly without the system upgrade requirement. Now that you've explored different PLC programming languages, which one do you think is the best and why? Share your thoughts in the comments. If you found this video helpful, support us by liking, sharing, and subscribing. Your engagement keeps us motivated to create more valuable content.